Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome Liz Varon to our Lincoln Log podcast. Liz is the Langhorn M. Williams Professor of American History at the University of Virginia. Her most recent book, Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War from Oxford University, was released in 2019 and just received the inaugural Wabash Literary Prize. Her specialist, a specialist in the Civil War era and the 19th century South, Professor Barron's other books include Southern Lady, Yankee Spy, The True Story of Elizabeth Van Lu, A Union Agent in the Heart of the Confederacy, and Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. Liz, thank you so much for joining the podcast. It's my pleasure to, uh, to be here today. Uh, always eager to talk about Lincoln with fellow Lincoln aficionados. Great. Uh, despite all the time that's passed, many Americans are still debating the North and the South's motivation for fighting the Civil War. Many believe Northerners fought to preserve the Union and it only later evolved into a struggle to end slavery. And obviously your book speaks directly to this issue. Is that the wrong way of thinking about it or how should we view the mo motivations of the North and the South? So that, that broad narrative of, of changing Union war aims, initially a focus on saving the Union and then the emergence of an emancipation policy, is not, is not wrong. Union war aims do change, but it's a little imprecise. So what, I, what I'm sort of trying to do here in my book and calling for is, is a little greater degree of pre precision, particularly as we think about the North the North represents a broad spectrum of political views. And part of what I tried to do is disaggregate the North into the various interest groups and, and get a sense of what their evolution looks like. So to give a sense of what I mean, there are in the North, of course, abolitionists and radical Republicans who believe from the very start of the war that it should be a war against slavery. Uh, and they uh, will, will push Lincoln uh, to, uh, to, towards his emancipation policy. And those abolitionists and radical Republicans, I'm thinking here of people like Frederick Douglass, Charles Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens, and so on, they believe in essence that the war is a, is a part of a broad campaign, ongoing campaign on two fronts, both against the horrors of Southern slavery and racism, but also a battle against persistent racial discrimination in the North where African-Americans are free, but, but relegated to a sort of second class citizenship. And so uh, uh, for them, what they're fighting for is the union, but a reimagined union, the sort of unfulfilled union, the union as it might be mm -hmm. if the nation is able to overcome the, the uh, slavery uh, and, and, and racism. At the extreme other end of the political spectrum in the North, you have conservative Democrats who are fighting for the union to quote their own slogan, as it was, uh, without uh, radical transformations. Uh, and they, many of them, come to accept emancipation as a, as a sort of military necessity, but they are ambivalent at best about Lincoln's policies, and, and most of them quite hostile to African-American aspirations for for citizenship and equality. And then of course, in the vast middle of the spectrum where most voters reside, you have people like Abraham Lincoln, a moderate Republican. And these moderates, self-styled moderates, had been uneasy, were uneasy, both about slavery and about abolition. Mm -hmm. And so they, they're, they too are fighting for, for union, a union in which the errant secessionist South will be restored to the national fold. And they come to embrace emancipation as a means to the end of saving the union. But they do so, even within that group, they do so for a range of reasons, some sort of expedient, pragmatic reasons, some reasons of moral principle and so on. So to my question, as I wrote this book that I, I wanted to answer to my own satisfaction and that of my readers was, how does Northern society coalesce to fight and win this long bloody war? How does Lincoln build a coalition out of these disparate elements? And, and what I found was that uh, 
this political theme of deliverance is, is the key to answering that question. Right. And it was certainly uh, motivations are complex. And I think, unfortunately, when we talk about this in the public sphere, sometimes we like to make make the answers a little too simple or, or easy. And it's just not always that easy as well. Right. I mean, we have to be we have to recognize the 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 uh, political complexity of both the north and the south. That's the theme I'll return to as 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 uh, as we talk in some sense, as I, as I put it to my students. There's no question that slavery is the root cause of the war and that secessionists start the war in order to uh, defend and uh, extend and perpetuate slavery. But even after we've recognized the centrality of slavery, we still have a lot of explaining to do about how and why it became so divisive and about, uh, and about why the war uh, took the shape that, that it did. Right. You characterize the North's uh, framing of the conflict as a, quote, war of liberation. Could you elaborate on what you mean by that? Yeah, so what I found as I did my research was that uh, the, what, what bound Northerners together and enabled Lincoln to, to, to uh, forge this coalition was a belief that they were fighting a war of deliverance. That was a, a term they used a lot. It's sort of fallen out of our political that vocabulary, had very strong religious overtones for many of them. A war of deliverance or of liberation, that was another word they used, although not as frequently, um, essentially to deliver the South and the Southern masses from the clutches of a secessionist slaveholding conspiracy, mm -hmm. a small group of elite secessionists who had engineered uh, secession as, as, uh, as they saw it. So a major premise of this idea of deliverance is that um, uh, the Southern masses have been deluded, uh, uh, cajoled, pressured, harassed into accepting uh, secession and that the spell that the secessionist elite has cast over them. Uh, has to be broken. So um, deliverance connoted the idea of delivering the masses from their leaders, in essence, saving the Southern people from their own leaders. It also connoted delivering to them the blessings of, of free society. Uh, and, and again, what I found was that deliverance appeals, the idea that the Union was fighting to save the South from itself and bring a, the errant Southern brethren or prodigal sons, as they were often imagined metaphorically back into the Union, had broad resonance in part because the, these different interest groups along the political spectrum I described could envision deliverance in different ways. Again, for abolitionists, this is deliverance from the national sin of, of slavery and racism for, um, for uh, uh, moderates like Lincoln, the emphasis is on restoring white Southerners to the national fold and to, uh, and, and to, to, to citizenship. So broad resonance, but also persistence. The scholars have recognized before that in the early days of the war, Northerners were really hoping to quick, quickly change Southern hearts and minds and, and, and again, sort of break the spell secessionists had cast as they uh, imagined it. What I found that surprised me and that needed explaining was that this belief that the Southern masses could be saved from their leaders and that they would welcome the Union Army's liberation persisted mm -hmm. deep into the war, e even in the face of massive evidence that Confederate whites did not want to be saved uh, in this way. So, so once I had uh, appreciated the duration, the, the, the persistence of this set of ideas, I, I sort of faced the challenge of trying to explain uh, why they persisted. And, and part of what I argue in this book is that deliverance rhetoric, this emphasis on Northerners as liberators of benighted, deluded, deceived Southerners, uh, that this persists because it fills emotional needs for mm. unionists who are experiencing this long and bloody war, who know that even if they wanted to, they couldn't, um, uh, you know, enforce the, the, the domination uh, of, of a territory as vast as the South, who hope that there's some end in sight rather than the, you know, mutually assured destruction of the societies who believe in, as historians have put it, an effective theory of union, meaning uh, a union, but bound together by bonds of affection. Mm -hmm. Northerners were hoping to restore those bonds of affection. And the idea that a small secessionist elite had deluded the Southern masses helped them cling to this idea of an effective union because they could reason that if 
the secessionist elite could be punished, everyone else could be forgiven and redeemed mm -hmm. and welcomed back uh, into the fold. So, so there's a real emotional investment in this idea of deliverance. And it seems like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like this, this myth of um, them being greeted as liberators seemed to be especially strong in Kentucky and Eastern Tennessee. Um, in those two particular cases, why do you think that never really came to, to, to play out that way? Well, I mean, really it's a great way. question. Obviously, this begs the question of uh, wh why Northerners clung so, so fiercely to this idea of, of, uh, of Southern liberation. And it begs the corollary question of to what degree were white Southerners dupes? What, to what degree were they invested in the Confederate project and so on? To put it another way, and I've already alluded to this, it can seem a little naive of Lincoln and other Northerners to believe that, uh, that this kind of deliverance was possible. We can see very clearly in retrospect that in the Confederate States, whites in the Confederate States were overwhelmingly committed to the Confederate cause and mm -hmm. many of them in a sort of diehard last ditch sort of way. So was it naive? This is raised implicitly by your question. And, and the answer is, um, Lincoln and others were so invested in this deliverance rhetoric, they looked around the landscape of the Union War and they saw signs for hope. The idea of deluded Southern masses who would welcome liberation was rooted in a Republican Party critique of the South, which mm. Lincoln and others had elaborated mm -hmm. in the pre-war period. And it was a critique that shined a light on the fact that um, Elite Southern slaveholding politicians were a tiny percentage of the American population, but they wielded this unseemly dominance over American politics. They seemed to have the non-slaveholding white Southern masses under their thumb. They had deprived those masses, so the Republican critique went of education, of free speech. The South was a society in which there was no free speech, widespread mm -hmm. uh, censorship of economic opportunity, and Republicans imagined that the non-slaveholding white Southerners, who were the majority, only about one in four white Southern families owned slaves on the eve of the Civil War, must resent those elite slaveholders who dominated their society and who, and who withheld from them, again, all the blessings right. of, 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 of free society. So that, that belief was a, uh, uh, was, a, was a strong belief. So the war starts, and to get back to your question about Kentucky and so on, Lincoln looked at the slaveholding border states, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, especially Delaware, a little bit of an afterthought, but all of them as essentially Southern places, slaveholding societies that the North had to wrest away from the control of aspiring secessionists. And, and as far as Lincoln and others were concerned, uh, on balance, um, uh, what was transpiring in Western Virginia, where unionists break off from the state, in Eastern Tennessee, where one after another call for help comes from uh, mm -hmm. the East Tennessee unionists, uh, from Kentucky, where sort of against all odds, a, 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 a Republican Party begins to get a, a foothold, same thing in, in uh, Missouri, but mostly uh, the most important um, sort of uh, 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 way of evaluating their policies was enlistment. Kentucky, Maryland, twice as many men sign up to fight in the Union Army than in the Confederate Army. So they win that battle for hearts and mm -hmm. minds. And Lincoln and, and, and others in his administration look at these things and say, deliverance is working. Kentucky is in the blue column. Maryland is in the blue column. Um, uh, 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 our, our party is, is getting a, a foothold, especially importantly in, 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 uh, in Maryland and Missouri, less so in Kentucky. Um, uh, unionism is coming to the fore in union occupied areas of the South, like uh, uh, in New Orleans, West Virginia has mm -hmm. broken away. Lincoln is even able to get some electoral votes from mm -hmm. these border South uh, places in 1864. So, so in their minds, in that sense, deliverance is working. And a second important point here is that, and this really struck me as I did my research, unionists who were invested in this deliverance ideology just um, fastened on what we would call anecdotal evidence, mm. individual examples that would prove that this deliverance was was a viable. Maybe they were seeing what they wanted to see. They in were a sense. seeing what yeah. they wanted to see. So what I argue in the book is that 
deliverance persists as a, as a hope and a war aim and a, and, a, and a theme in union politics because it's ideological, you know, and ideologies frame right. what we see and don't see. Uh, and so unionists took every story of a deserter who came into union lines and said, oh, Confederates are losing heart or every story of a wounded Southern soldier who's tended by a Northern, you know, nurse or doctor and says, oh, I didn't, I didn't, you know, realize you all, uh, you know, uh, uh, would treat me humanely, I was told otherwise, or every, every story of a, of a refugee in a union occupied area of the South who welcomes union aid and food and so on. All of these things, they, they interpreted as signs that deliverance might, might work. And right. in a way, the, the, you know, the, the key to the whole theory was that it wasn't really refutable until the secessionist conspiracy had been broken. And, and that doesn't happen until the end of the war. And, and, and unionists, again, continue to have great faith in it. Um, the, the most stark policy application of this, of course, is Lincoln's amnesty policy, which is, mm -hmm. which is along with emancipation, a signature policy, but one that we talk about less. Um, Lincoln essentially is offering a restoration of rights to uh, Confederates who are willing to take an oath of future allegiance to the Union and willing to agree to abide by the laws of the government, including emancipation. That's sort of wiping the slate clean for them. And then he's willing to, to build new Unionist state governments out of the, 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 that little vanguard of those willing to take that oath in his so-called 10% plan. And, and it's just impossible to overstate how invested Lincoln was in this plan. He, he, mm -hmm. he absolutely hoped that it would drain troops away in the form of desertion from the Confederacy and that it would help in places like Louisiana and Tennessee and Arkansas. Uh, it would help. And then one more, one more th uh, thing on that, on that theme. Uh, not only did, did Lincoln and, and other Republicans put a lot of emphasis on what they saw as good signs in the border slaveholding South or, or on anecdotal evidence of the kind I've presented. They also put a lot of emphasis on the fact that there was a small but symbolically very important number of white Southerners who embraced Lincoln's policies. Mm -hmm. Andrew Johnson of Tennessee is the, is the most obvious example. And as we see in Reconstruction, there were limits to how much he embraced them. But nonetheless, he came to accept that emancipation was a military necessity. A few other key people, Kentucky Republicans, Cassius Clay, uh, um, uh, for example, um, uh, were held up as evidence that it was possible to change Southern hearts and minds. It was possible to bring mm -hmm. Southerners uh, on board, uh, 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 even with policies like emancipation. And, and so a lot of the focus, I think, of the book and certainly our discussion so far has been, what did the North think of themselves and what did the North think of the South? But I'm curious, from your perspective, what did the Southerners think of themselves in the war, uh, both sort of the quote unquote planter class and then ordinary citizens? How, how did they view their their role and their place in the in the war. That, that's a great question, and you know, one of the things I try to do here, very much influenced by um, the historian William Freeling, who's written a lot about Lincoln, a great recent mm -hmm. book about Lincoln's uh, political rise, but also a wonderful book called *The South Versus the South* about fault lines within the South. I, I, I try to begin with the premise um, that uh, that the, that the South was divided, and that we need to be. Um, uh, we, we have to be careful not to equate the South with the Confederacy. So the most important observation there, obviously, is that African Americans in the South were Unionists, and that mm -hmm. ends up being absolutely crucial. Uh, as Freeling and others have noted, the Union will eventually enlist about 200,000 African American soldiers and sailors, a decisive contribution to, to the Northern War effort, nearly 80% of those Union soldiers and sailors are Southerners who have mm. fled slavery to join Union lines and so on. So that, that's one, um, you know, one, one uh, opening uh, uh, point. When we're talking about white Southerners, what did they, uh, you know, think, uh, this gets back to this question of, 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 of uh, you know, uh, how um, deep support for the Confederacy was. And I think there the, the, the thing to note is that um, white Southerners were very keenly attuned to this deliverance rhetoric and wanted to preempt it by discrediting mm -hmm. any appeals to the uh, Southern masses. 
So if, for the union, fundamentally, the purpose of the war is to bring Southerners back into the fold. For Confederates, the premise of the war is that Northerners and Southerners can never be countrymen again, not ever. And so the main goal of Confederate propaganda and ideology is to suggest that it's impossible for there to ever be uh, a reunion. And to that end, Confederate propaganda and ideology stipulates even before the first shots are fired that the Yankee army is an army of ruthless uh, conquerors whose, mm -hmm. whose goal is the extermination, degradation, pollution. These are the sort of key words of Southern <laughs> rhetoric if deliverance right. and liberation are the key words on the Northern side, that the uh, Northern army is an army of mercenary conquerors uh, that will fight a war to the knife, a ruthless war, uh, 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 race war, war of insurrection, and so on, um, a war without limits uh, uh, against white Southerners. And again, these claims, these, this kind of claim is, is at the heart of how secessionists engineer support for their movement. It, we see this, this kind of rhetoric even before the first shots have been fired, but it only gets ramped up over the, over the course of the war. Um, as, as we just alluded to, there were pockets of unionism among white Southerners. Obviously, the border states are one case, but even in the Confederate states, the seceded states, we see pockets of unionism. You mentioned East Tennessee as an example. I wrote a biography of a Civil War spy named Elizabeth Van Lu, who was operating mm -hmm. in Richmond, the Confederate capital, mm -hmm. the heart of the Confederacy. There was a similar a sort of underground unionist cell in Atlanta, mm -hmm. so some in the urban South too. But those white Southerners who were active unionists in the Confederate states were a tiny number and they were beleaguered. Uh, the Confederates essentially um, tried to roust out uh, unionists. They, there was a culture of fear and repression to stamp out uh, uh, dissent. Uh, and so in other words, we see very little active white Southern unionism in the seceded states, but we do see a lot of, of a sort of closing of the ranks to suppress this kind of, uh, of dissent. So, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, the takeaway there simply is that uh, uh, the operation of Confederate ideology and Confederate propaganda on the Southern body politic created all of these barriers to union deliverance rhetoric. And I'll say one more thing about that. Again, the premise of Republican politics. And for Lincoln and his party, we have to remember, as the scholar James Oakes has explained so, so well, Republicans go into the war saying, we want to restrict strict slavery spread. We're not going to touch it where it already exists. What they were hoping was that if they could restrict the spread of slavery, the latent uh, um, uh, resentment of slaveholders would come to the fore, that non-slaveholding white Southern majority would see that the institution was not going to expand, that it was not viable. They would undertake measures on their own to begin to slowly dismantle the institution. This was the Republican hope or, 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 or mm -hmm. fantasy. Um, that's based on a major misunderstanding of Southern society. It's true that only one in four white Southerners own slaves, but if we count in and factor in the number of non-slaveholders who were related to slave owners, who hoped to one day own slaves, who hired slaves, who worked for slave owners, and so mm -hmm. on, we see that the investment in the institution uh, uh, among whites was very, very broad, right. uh, an investment in it as an institution of profit making and also of social control. And so Northern ideology fails to, 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 to recognize the depth of that, of that investment. Right. When I think about Southern motivation, I'm, I, I can never get out of my mind a quote from Shelby Foote, who said, um, a Southerner was once asked, why are you fighting this war? And the Southerner responds, because you're down here. <laughs> right. Well, but, but, but the, yeah, right. But, and, and again, I mean, you, that, that's, a, it's great you bring that up because just as you said, there's layers of complex complexity here because you're down here to do what, right? The right. union soldiers faith, notion was I'm down here to save you, to improve your life, mm -hmm. to, to, to bring to you the blessings of, of, uh, of, uh, of, again, a free labor society. But, but the, the, the uh, you know, political powers uh, and opinion makers in, in the Confederacy had encouraged that soldier to think that the Yankees were there mm 
to 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 exterminate him and mm -hmm. to to uh, uh, you know to to turn the world upside down. And so and so ideology matters. You know, nothing right. even the most the most seemingly simple. Uh, uh, you know, uh, phrase has layers of ideology. Sure, yeah. Often. But, you know, this topic, uh, it's surprising to me. I mean, how, how many, you know, years later, and it's still relevant, it's still discussed, it's still debated, it's still talked about. So I can understand why anybody who's interested in history might be motivated to write about this topic. But I, is there something in particular that sort of was the impetus for you taking on this project? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, this was an interesting assignment for me. I was commissioned to write this book oh, wow. as, a, okay. as a, by Oxford University Press, as, as a textbook that would be uh, suitable for classroom use with college students, perhaps uh, advanced high school ones. And, and I, and I, but it, along the lines of James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom, which had a life as a, as a, as a book for the general public and then right. in a somewhat different format as a textbook. So I was very keen on, on, on writing a book that would work in both ways as a general mm -hmm. good read for, for uh, readers like your listeners, uh, but also as a, as a, as a tool for, for teachers. And when I started writing the book, the, the, I didn't have a thesis. The textbook doesn't particularly need one. My, my, I more had a method, a goal of integrating social history, and cultural history and sort of on the ground human experiences with military and political and diplomatic history. This has been a kind of theme of my career to say, we've mm -hmm. got to try to get it all in there because it's, it's, it's fascinating. And that, and that meant, uh, for example, uh, things like pointing out the centrality of women to every, every theme I've talked about uh, so far. Women are, are, are uh, essential in, in making arguments for and against deliverance. Women are essential in, in, um, uh, coping with the ways the war becomes a huge humanitarian crisis through their medical work and and and, and in many other ways. Uh, my my spy Elizabeth Van Lu, a good good example of the fact that they're mm -hmm. relevant even to military tactics and so on. Um, so I had goals like that. I also had a sense as a, as a teacher, someone who's taught college students for years and years and years, about sort of what what works. I I am essentially sort of intellectual historian at heart, a historian of ideas. And I love studying political rhetoric and political ideas. So I wanted to frame this book and frame the war as a war of ideas, feeling mm. that students may or may not remember, you know, what I told them about Perryville 10 years from now, but they, but, but if they have a, a sense and interpretive framework for understanding the war, that's right. more likely to be meaningful. So uh, on those lines, you know, I, I've been very taken by, absolutely fascinating speech that Frederick Douglass gave in 1878 that's often quoted. It's the one in which he says there was a right side and a wrong side in the late war, which no sentiment ought to cause us to forget. One of your guests, David Blight, has right. talked about these themes. Douglass was afraid people were forgetting that. Right. And so that's why he makes the speech. But he, in that speech, he frames the war as a war of ideas. He says it's a war between the old and the new, between slavery and freedom, between barbarism and civilization. And, and part of the goal of the book was for students to understand what Douglas meant when he said that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he certainly didn't mean that Northerners were all moral paragons. Douglas was in the vanguard uh, of, a, of a movement fighting against Northern racism. He was very clear eyed right. about, about, the, about the, the flaws in these societies, but he was arguing nonetheless that even after we've recognized the divisions within the North and the South, even after we've recognized how, how brutal the war became. There is, uh, the Union and the Confederacy represented starkly different political systems and destinies for America. The, the mm -hmm. Union uh, ideology posited that elite slaveholders should no longer dominate American government. Confederate ideology wanted to protect the power of elite slaveholders. Union ideology posited that slavery was a drain on American productivity. And, and moral strength and that on one timetable or another, in one way or another, the country would be better off without it. Confederates were trying to, again, extend and perpetuate uh, slavery. The Union gave us Lincoln, this leader of incredible uh, moral courage and growth and humility. The Confederacy gave us uh, uh, sort of false idols like Robert E. Lee and asked people to bow down in, in sort of worshipful reverence of them. These are, these, are, th these are important differences. And it was the differences that Douglas was calling attention to in that speech. And I wanted students to understand that in part 
to sort of guard against false equivalency between uh, the Union and the, uh, and the Confederacy. So there was a sort of broad sense of wanting them to be able to think of the war, again, in all of its complexity, in all the ways we've, we've discussed, mm -hmm. uh, not a monolithic North and South, but complex political spectrums, but to understand that at the heart of all this, it is a war of ideas. Right. Well, I have to say I'm very impressed with both the research detail and the wonderful prose that you offer in Armies of Deliverance. What was your method for researching and writing this book from a sort of maybe an overview, but also on a day-to-day -day basis, how you went about attacking it? Yeah, I mean, so from an overview perspective, as something that needs to function as a, as a, as a one volume you know, survey uh, and, as, and as something suitable as a textbook, what I wanted more than anything else was to make sure that all the best of modern scholarship is, is represented here. So I read a lot of, you know, what we call secondary sources, a lot of recent sure. works of modern scholarship to try to synthesize all of the great work that has been done. And, and that, um, you know, there were, there were some, some uh, books like Glenn, Glenn Brasher's wonderful book about the, the Peninsula Campaign and how, man, how emancipation policy unfolds there that were really good models of how to integrate battle history with, mm. with politics and, and sort of grassroots activism. I had certain books that, you know, uh, um, in other words, that were models for me. I, I'm a huge George Rabel fan. I feel like his mm. books, a book like Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, these sort of mm -hmm. brilliant ways of, of setting a battle in its social and right. political context. So, the, the, you know, the, that kind of book was very important to me too. I tried to be up to speed on the best Lincoln scholarship. Edna Medford's work on Lincoln, especially mm -hmm. to me, is, is just so, so um, yeah, insightful. Um, I, I wanted to be up to date on, on, on uh, literature on, on resistance by the enslaved and on the emancipation process of Thavolia Glimpse books and so on. So I had, it, you know, for each of the important themes, I had some some go-to books, but as a practical matter in this book, the, my main primary source research in, in the first-hand accounts was really a, in Union soldiers' writings. That, that's mm -hmm. what I wanted to, to know about most. I, I, by training, have been a historian of the South in most of, in most of my books are about the South and about Virginia, which is my, my home state. Um, so I had a little bit of a learning curve with regards to Northern uh, you know, war aims and, and mm -hmm. sources. So I really tried to immerse myself in letters and diaries by Union soldiers. I had access to a wonderful collection, which has just come to UVA and will be, you know, open to the public when libraries are open again, um, uh, of letters collected by, by John Now, a great uh, civil oh, war, yeah. uh, you know, patron and, and, uh, and um, so knowledgeable uh, and such a great collector. So I read a lot of firsthand accounts um, that way. And, and the key observation there is that, um, you know, if I had seen this deliverance rhetoric that I've described only in public kinds of sources in newspaper editorials and political speeches and sermons and so on, I, I, I wouldn't have given it the centrality I did. What, what made it a major theme for me an organizing theme is the way I saw it in these in the moment sources, the private sources, the private letter written in the moments after a battle by a soldier to his wife, for example. And what I saw in those in the moment so sources was Union soldiers repeating this idea that they were fighting a war to save the South from itself, mm. repeating it like a mantra, as, as though they'd been sort of handed a script from which to read. <laughs> uh, right. uh, this this was so deeply internalized by them, and that and that um, really uh, influenced me a lot. I have to say, one of the projects I'm working on is a is a history of a regiment out of Southern Illinois, um, in part because I had a lot of ancestors that were part of that, and I've worked over the years to collect as many letters as I can from the regiment at the time. And I, I found myself seeing a lot of the same rhetoric in, in, in theirs, you know, and it's, I hesitate to take one regiment or a handful of soldiers letters that I've collected and say that's for everyone, but I'll just, right. there's another data point that I think supports what you're talking about. Well, that's great. Yeah. And I mean, again, you know, what, as you know, just as you say, you know, for us, context is everything. And, and I benefited immensely from work like the work you're doing that people have done representing the different regions of the country. Mm -hmm. Again, if I'd only seen this among New England soldiers, well, it wouldn't have been as meaningful, but I, but I found it, uh, you know, in the mid-Atlantic, in the Midwest, and so right. on among soldiers who were Republicans. Democrats, you know, sort of across across the spectrum, and that and that's that's what sort of flagged it for me as something that that was an important organizing theme. Right. Um, we obviously see a lot of uh, 
very divided and contentious politics today, and some would even worry we have the seeds or the beginning of a modern civil war. With your very uh, broad expertise and knowledge of, of the civil war past, civil war politics, um, what do you make of those kind of comparisons? Do you, do you worry about us um, getting a little too close for comfort to, to the political makeup of the civil war? I mean, I think, it, you know, analogies are, are, are important and, and we have to think, you know, critically and carefully and with precision about them. A scenario that we had in 1861 of a region of the country dominated by this class of secessionists uh, of seceding to form an independent nation and then mobilizing a, a massive uh, army and a society-wide mobilization uh, in order to break away from the Union. I, I, I don't think that scenario is in the cards. On the other hand, we do see parallels in, in the sense that um, there's there was a secessionist playbook of fear mongering of divide and conquer trying to suggest that race relations was a zero sum game that any mm. gains for african americans would come at the expense of whites trying right. to pit americans against each other uh through what they saw as kind of dystopian um uh, 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 uh overheated uh, rhetoric about what would happen if their political opponents prevailed. And that kind of fear mongering is dangerous. And, 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 and uh, you know, we, we do see far too much of it. And I think, I think that there are real parallels in the ways that um, the abolitionists were treated. The ab you know, there was a massive uphill battle for abolitionists. They come on the scene in the 1830s with a critique of slavery and racism. And, and Southern slaveholders, to be sure, Southern whites, but also some Northerners sort of close ranks in an anti-abolition movement that demonizes the abolitionists mm. as, as sources of anarchy and violence and, and so on, even as the abolitionists are, are, are committed to, to peaceful moral suasion. That demonization of reformers and of protesters is something I think we see in the, in the, in the present day, and, and that's, that's very dangerous. And, and, and uh, um, you know, I, I think I think there is a danger of our democracy being being undermined from within. And and personally, I feel that uh, you know Donald Trump is taking many many measures to undermine our democracy from within uh, that uh, that are that are very very worrisome and that do alas tear pages whether he knows it or not tears pages from the playbook uh, of, uh, of of secessionists and defenders of slavery. I, I wish I didn't have to say that, but that's that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, uh, our listeners here are Lincoln aficionados and, and love Lincoln. So we always like to include this question with our guests. Do you have a favorite Lincoln story or anecdote that you'd like to share? So um, I, I, I will give you an answer that's not terribly original, but that sort of comes back around to what we were just talking about. I, I just love his letter to U.S. Grant after Vicksburg. I was wrong and you were right. I mean, to me, now especially, that expression of humility uh, is, you know, to admit you're wrong. Imagine that as a president. Right. I mean, I think in order to grow as Lincoln did, um, you have to, you know, you have to uh, be willing to admit you're wrong and, 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 and to, you know, sometimes follow the lead. Again, Grant's brilliant Vicksburg plan that seemed so dangerous and risky and, and one can understand why Lincoln would have, would have balked a little bit, but Grant pulled it off and Lincoln had the decency to say, you were right and I was wrong. I, I, I think that speaks volumes about who Lincoln was. Right. I, I think that exhibits a certain amount of certainly emotional maturity, but also security and confidence in himself to that's be able to exactly admit that. That's exactly right. Well. Yeah, I think that's very, very well put. I th and, and that that goes to the you know broader qu leadership question we're talking about a lot these days. That That is not an admission of weakness. That's a sign of strength and confidence. Exactly. Right. Uh, to you know, talk in, in in the in the case of, of 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 Grant Lincoln, really that confidence was very very well placed, and and you know people have observed Jefferson Davis was a micromanager of his generals. There was endless backbiting and infighting and so on. And Lincoln was so good about saying to Grant, to an extent to Sherman and Sheridan, "Hey, here's the job, get it done." Uh, and, and and that you know again, I think it's a sign of confidence. I think that's 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 beautifully put. Well. It if any, any of our listeners are interested in a book on uh, on a general history of the Civil War, but certainly, as you mentioned, from, from the ideology, from the ideas behind it, I cannot recommend enough uh, 
Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War. And now we can say it's an award-winning book. Probably we already could. I'm sure it's maybe even gotten some others. But, but um, I really uh, commend you for uh, this project. I know your other ones were, were wonderful as well. So um, please keep contributing to this wonderful body of work and the scholarship that you've done. You've done a great job. Well, I, I really appreciate it. And, 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 you know, particularly in these times of social distancing an opportunity to connect with readers like this is very much, uh, you know, very much valued. So thank you everyone uh, who tunes in. I really do appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Thank you for listening to Lincoln Log. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show. 